And what I just started to realize is for how much work that was going into finding the finding the deal, yep. um, dealing with property management, all the partnership things of the back and forth, and then dealing with taxes, like all this stuff, um, it didn't start to feel super passive for me, um, that mailbox money. Welcome to the Threefold Real Estate Investing Podcast. This is the podcast where you'll not only learn how you can achieve massive success in multifamily real estate investing, but also how you can simultaneously pursue great relationships with your family and a better walk with God. You can achieve financial freedom through real estate investing without sacrificing the relationships that mean the most to you. Now, here's your host, Lee Yoder. Welcome back, Three Full listeners. I hope you're having a great week this week. We've got another great guest lined up for you today. Luke Greesop is joining us from out in Scottsdale, Arizona. Uh, but Luke is actually an Ohio native, uh, moved out to Arizona in 2015. We were just um, talking a little small town Ohio, a little Ohio football. Uh, but but we'll, we'll move on from that and um, talk more about Luke and, and, and how he got into multifamily. So he started his sales career out in the desert. Um, been working about six, six and a half years. Uh, for a, a company called Apartment List, uh, which is an online rental marketplace uh, for, for renters, for, for apartment owners like us. Um, soon after being exposed to the multifamily industry through this company, he began to learn how powerful real estate investing can be, um, did some burring, uh, then moved into multifamily uh, as a passive investor, as a limited partner. Uh, so today he's a passive investor or a limited partner in three syndications totaling 500 units. Uh, his main focus now is educating his network on the power of real estate investing, presenting offerings that align with their goals. Um, so he's hoping, you know, get more people into to passively investing in real estate, which is which is what we're trying to do. So Luke, welcome to the show, man. So glad you could join us. Uh, me too, Lee. Um, I had, it was awesome that we could connect right before this and, and learn about the Ohio roots. Um, so thank yeah. you for sharing that. And thanks again for having me on. Yeah. Yeah. It's always, it's always fun. It was cool meeting people uh, from the same area. So Luke, um, real quick on your background, just you you were you went out to Arizona presumably you know for for work have that job you've been doing it um but tell us a little bit about like working at, at apartment list and you know what got you to kind of start understanding multifamily from like an investment side not just say hey, I, I work in the industry you know as a w2 just making money you know for my living but what got you moving over to like starting to understand it as an investment vehicle and then kind of deciding that's what you wanted to do I never even knew what real estate investing was until yeah, um, probably either. about 20, you know, probably yeah. until about 2017. Um, yeah. And that was two years into my journey out here in Arizona. Uh, and a friend of mine at our, my first W2 position was, um, was at Yelp doing sales there. And okay. so as I started to think more about my long-term horizon, what I wanted in the future, thinking about retirement, his family was in uh, real estate. And so he had brought up the idea of real estate investing to me. But again, I didn't know what it even meant. So I yeah. did a quick Google search around that time and just typed in real estate investing and of course stumbled upon bigger pockets. And yeah. from there, I just went, you know, I went to the podcast university, as people call it, and just started yeah. trying to educate myself. I read a bunch of books. And the first thing that I um, did was just buy a turnkey rental in Columbus, Ohio. And yeah. I had a I who who ended up being my partner um, in those bird deals. He was also a realtor, and so we did three single family homes, four, four units. One had an ADU, yeah. and so we did those. Um, we bird them. We still have them. But as I started to continue to educate myself and learn more, and really thought about my long term goals of of passive income but still having exposure to real estate, just not necessarily wanting to be always the boots on the ground, the operations, right. dealing with brokers. Um, I continued to hear this theme on podcasts about go bigger, faster. And so mm -hmm. multifamily piqued my interest. And it also made sense because I was working at apartment list where I'm still working today. Yeah. Okay. And it just, the, the stars started to align a little bit and it just made sense for me to get involved in multifamily. And so, yeah. um, a little over a year ago, made my first passive investment and um, have done two more since then. Okay, awesome. So going back to the, so starting in single family, so many people do. You start in single family. Uh, sounds like you had a pretty good experience with it because uh, you mentioned the, the term burn and people don't know what it means, buy, rehab, rent it out, refinance, and then re repeat. So you bought some single family homes, you get some renters in there. Presumably they they became, you know, they, they got to the point where they're worth more money so that you can 
get a new loan on them, pull your money out and, and, and keep it going. So that's a pretty good experience. You had it, you had a partner that was a boots on the ground, but um, as you say, like you, you started thinking, man, maybe I don't want to just keep doing this a bunch of time. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Why not just keep going with that model that was, you know, doing pretty well? Why jump into the multifamily? That's the, that's the funny thing is they all were going well. I mean, on our yeah. very first Burr deal, we pulled out the exact amount of capital we put in. It was like the awesome. textbook Burr property. Yeah. Yep. And what I just started to realize is for how much work that was going into finding the finding the deal, yep. um, dealing with property management, all the partnership things of the back and forth, and then dealing with taxes, like all this stuff, um, it didn't start to feel very, super passive for me, right. um, that mailbox money. Yep. And um, for how much work was going in it, what you start to learn is when, for how much work goes into it, even, even when you're getting really good spreads on... Yep you know, on, on your, uh, on your cash flow versus paying all the expenses, paying the mortgage. And then again, for your listeners, whatever's left over is your cash flow. that start on paper. It looked fantastic and it still yep. looks fantastic. But what you start to realize is that cash flow tends to look better on paper for properties that don't cost a lot of money. Maybe it's a C class property where you're able to put in the renovations. And so on paper, your cash flow looks really good, but then you deal with tenant turnover um, yep. you deal with more repairs and maintenance that come up because they're older homes. And yep. so the cash flow on paper looked fantastic, but then it didn't meet your expectations uh when it came to what was actually being put in your bank account. Yep. And so through that process, I just started to learn that I I want to be a passive investor and I do want to just collect the check and not necessarily deal with all the headaches. Um right. and so that's what that's what helped me make that pivot from single family to multi. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's really helpful. And I think that's a lot of people's experience. I mean, you know, I, I can imagine these are just some rough numbers, but you get a single family home and on paper, it looks like, Hey, maybe we're going to, maybe we're going to pull in, you know, $400 a month. I mean, we pay all the expenses or we, we bring in the income. Maybe that's, you know, a, a thousand bucks a month. We're paying all the expenses. It's, it's 600. We're going to profit 400 bucks a month. I mean, that's $4,800 a year. So let's yep. just, you know, let's call it 5,000, man, making $5,000 on a house, um, you know, starts to sound pretty good. Gosh, we get four of these like, like you do. $20,000 a year, not bad. But, you know, you replace one roof, it costs 10,000. You just cut your profit in half, right? So yep. 20,000 all of a sudden, actually it was only 10,000. So actually yeah. it was only $2,500 per property. And so, yeah, you have one year of that. And I, and I think that's a lot of people's experience where they go, yeah, on, you know, I, it, it all looks so good and it was going so well. And then we replaced one roof and it's only $10,000 a year. So now you're starting to think, well, okay, hey, still 10 grand a year, great. And like you said, we put our money out and, and they're cash flowing. But then your, your calculation is like, all right, do I want to go do another deal? Do I want to go find another house, take down another house, raise the money, get a loan, do all these things for $2,500 a year. Mm -hmm. And then do another one for $2,500 a year. You know, even for 5,000, it's like, it is, like you said, uh, Luke, it, it's a lot of work. And the more you get, like, it, it is a little bit active. So you're starting to look for something more passive because even after four deals, and again, so many people go, go down this path. And even after just four, you know, little single families that you got help on, it's still active enough and then not enough, you know, return for you to go, what else is there? Let's move into multifamily. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, totally with you in there. That was a little bit of my experience, a little bit different, but, but kind of same, same flavor. Um, a lot of people go through that. Um, so that's why it's good to have people like you on Luke, because you've already been through it. So maybe some people decide to, to skip that part. Hey, I'll skip yeah. the, the four single families in Columbus and I'll just jump into multifamily. So, and it's absolutely it's, doable through yeah. syndication. It's absolutely, you yep. know, you, you don't, you, you can learn so much. I mean, obviously when you are hands-on, you're, you have your hands on the operation, the renovations, the broker relationships, you're going to learn a lot more with, um, doing all of that, but you can yep. still learn a, what you need to know when you're a passive investor, especially assuming you have a really good sponsor or operator who's willing to talk to you. Yes. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. That's a big time to that. Well, let, so let's get into that a little bit. So Luke, you decided to get into multifamily. Um, you've done three. So, you, you know, still pretty new at it, right? Um, mm -hmm. And we've maybe, I, I think a lot of my listeners um, haven't even done one yet. Maybe they've, they've one or, done one or two. So a lot of people um, in the situation, in, in the same um, situation that you're in now, but then a lot of them are where you were maybe, you know, a couple of years ago when you hadn't started yet. So what are some good first steps and then uh, let's get into a little bit of like, what are some things to watch out for? Help help my listeners, you know, um, get started and, and, and get to where you are over the next year or so. Definitely. So um, the, the three areas of focus are on uh, your sponsor, the market and the deal. And the way yep. I think about it, 
um, is in that order. So finding a good sponsor, which you can do through bigger pockets, you can go to, you know, one, one that's actually in Ohio is left field investors. They're based yes. out of Columbus. Yep. Um, that's a fantastic I'm resource to look into. Yep. Oh, awesome. Yep. I had no idea. Uh, finding good sponsors through again, some means like bigger pockets or left field investors and just going to like local meetups to hear, um, hear about sponsors that you can get in touch with and then having a call with that sponsor and a few things to look out for, um, or keep tabs on is like their track record, especially like asking the question, are they in that market you're about to invest in? Because just like a, a group that I invest with here in Phoenix, they're moving into Dallas now. My preference is to let them get a few deals under their belt in Dallas first before mm -hmm. I would go invest in the first yeah. one. So yeah. knowing, not only knowing their track record of success, but the knowing the markets they're in, yeah. a good thing to look out for it and point blank, ask the sponsor operators, tell me about a time that something went wrong for you, mm -hmm. because that'll just help. That'll help really uh, hone in on the experience that they have. Yeah. Um, and what's communication going to look like? Am I hearing from you weekly, monthly, quarterly, like do something that aligns with your preference. Um, yes. If you're not comfortable with quarterly updates, then find someone who will at least provide monthly updates. Yeah. Um, and then another good tip when it comes to vetting out a sponsor is ask to speak to current or past investors and hear about their experience. Yes. If you ask that of a sponsor, they should have no problem referring you to a couple of people. For sure. Um, yeah. So that's another tip when it comes to vetting out a sponsor. And the number one thing that you're really trying to weed out there is integrity. You want to know mm -hmm. that they're honest um, communicative and that you, you know, you can trust them with $50,000. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and it, it is so important. You're absolutely right. You're looking for a sponsor with integrity. Um, that's so important. I love the question about what did you do when things went wrong? Every sponsor, if they've been doing it long enough, which you hope they have, um, has gone through a tough time. So they ought to be able to explain that to you. Um, and then hopefully they can talk about how they continued communicating. They made things right, things like that. Um, and then I, I really like the part about you know, have they been investing in that market? And even have they invested in that type of property? If, if it's their first A-class property, like you, said, like you might want to let them try that out first before you jump in on, on mm -hmm. an A-class property with them. And and I would just say, you know, as an operator myself, I I think that's great advice because it's it's really difficult to operate properties really well. So I feel much more comfortable continuing to do it in my market because I've done it here and I've got the property management company. We got the cruise, right? Like everything's yeah. here. It's easy. The second we go to Columbus, even I would use the same property management company. So that's going to be very helpful because they're already there. So I, that makes me feel a lot better, but it will be a little different. Um, things are a little bit different up there, a little hotter, you know, just a little bit different market. So it's really good advice on. And on that's a good point on property management as well. Property managers can be, I mean, you're the lifeblood of you as an 100%. operator. Oh, yeah. I mean, just asking, Hey, do you want to op? Do you want to manage a property in this area? For oh, example, yeah. And putting yeah. it back on them and just hearing their feedback. Yep. Yep. Absolutely, man. So number two would be the market. Two would what be the market. the market. Look, look the, the three that I always, that stick out to me are population growth, job growth, and median household income growth. Those yeah. are like the three things. Another one I would add in there um, is just uh, trying to do some research on the, uh, the industry that's there. You don't want it to be too heavily weighted toward one industry. Yeah. Um, you know, for example, I, just using a random thing that comes to mind, like Odessa, Texas. Um, that's a very big oil town from what mm. I understand. I'm no uh -huh. expert on Odessa, Texas, but um, looking out for examples like that, where one industry drives the entire economy, because if that industry is having a hard time, you're going to see people moving, um, people leaving the town or city that you're investing in. Um, <clears throat> that's one of the reasons why Phoenix and Las Vegas got hit so hard during the right. 08 financial crisis is because there were so many construction jobs. Yep. Um, now, since that's really changed, it, it's a lot more diversified, but when no one's building and we're in a financial crisis and it was started by, you know, the mortgage market, yeah, there's right. going to be issues yeah, and a lot of people are going to be leaving. And, and so yep. places like Phoenix and Las Vegas got hit way harder than somewhere like Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, sure. yep. And, or even Texas, a lot of markets in Texas. So, um, those are like, a f those are the four things that come to mind first for me, population growth, job growth, median household income. And again, if you don't find great resource online, I don't have a particular website to go look at, but if you look at population growth in Chandler, Arizona, 
on Google, they're going to provide a Google Trends oh, will provide yeah. a chart to you immediately. Yep. Um, the U.S. Census Bureau will probably be able to provide some details around jobs to make sure yep. that that's increasing. But again, if population's increasing, the jobs are likely increasing as oh, well. Right. Yeah. Those two pretty much go hand in hand, right? Yeah. 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 yeah, but you're, then, you're, yeah it's a good point that like, hey, let's say we're in an oil boom and population growth and job growth in Odessa, Texas are going higher. That's going to be good as long as we're in an oil boom, but oil tends to be kind of cyclical. And when it comes down, then, you know, all of a sudden you're on the wrong side. Of it. So great point to put that in too. Like, is this sustainable? We've got yeah. some good job growth. We've got some good population growth, but is it sustainable? Is there a bunch of different, you know, industries here, a bunch of different companies here? Is it, is it well diversified? It's really good yeah. Stuff. And yeah. then um, with, with the median household income, considering how that ties into home values in general, um, because the more expensive homes are, that's a bigger tailwind for for rentals yeah and people have to be able to afford your rent so we only want them to spend a quarter of their income on the rent maybe, maybe up maybe some people say maybe up to 30 percent. but yeah. hey, if you want to be conservative maybe a quarter maybe even 20 percent. and if it, if you know they're making you know 40 50 grand a year and they can easily cover your rent then you feel good yeah we can charge that rent because these mm-hmm. populations can be able to afford it so it's a great yeah. point yeah good stuff man um okay and then and then you're uh, looking at the deal on for number three Yep. So the deal, um, number one for me on the deal, quite frankly, is debt terms. Um, oh, thinking yeah. about Especially thinking today. about thinking about LTV um, in today's market, it's probably anywhere from a fifty to sixty percent LTV. Um, you know, it was two years ago. It was probably a seventy to seventy-five LTV. Uh, an LTV is just a loan to value. So the, the same way you think about what kind of debt, or sorry, what kind of um, down payment are you going to have on your single family? house when you purchase it, let's say it's a 25% down payment, that's a 70% loan to value. Yep. It's just looking at the entire value of the asset. What what percent is the bank going to lend you on that? Right. So we're buying a $10 million apartment. Last year, maybe the bank gives you 7.5 million of that. You got to go raise 2.5. Today, bank maybe is only willing to give you 6 million. You've got to go raise 4 million. Yep. That's a perfect example. And so what do you what do you like to see? What, what What's your preference or, or just, yeah, talk a little bit more about that. It, it, I think it definitely depends on what lenders are willing to do in today's environment. And yeah. one thing, uh, one tidbit I want to throw out there for the listeners is keep in mind that lent, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, all these huge lending institutions out there are very well sophisticated and they're the biggest investor in your property. Sure. <laughs> so yeah. the guidelines that they have, I mean, we you should have put at least some faith or some trust in that. Yeah. Um, and so it, like the most recent deal I invested in that made me feel pretty good was a 60 LTV based okay. on where, where things are today. Yep. Um, and then that leads into the second thing, which is, is it a variable rate or a fixed rate? Mm-hmm. So keep, keep that in mind with the deal. Variable mm-hmm. rate just means it can fluctuate, um, based on what's happening with short-term interest rates. Yep. Uh, whereas a fixed rate, you're just locking that in for the life of the loan, which is always helps people sleep at night. Yep. yep. And the variable rates hundred percent. Okay. You just want to make sure that they have a rate cap bought on that on that rate, so that it can it can only hit a certain level. Yes, um, yeah, good point. Especially in today, uh, I mean, yeah, rates especially surprised everybody. Today. A lot of people got hurt. Especially today, yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, you're seeing a lot of that out in the market right now. Mm-hmm. Distributions on a lot of deals have stopped because of mm-hmm. the the interest rates going too high. Right. Yeah, the bank's suddenly taking all the profit, and you can't send it to the investor. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. And then the last two things are exit cap and assumptions. Um, yeah. I think an exit exit cap rate just ensure, ensuring that they, are, you know, your operator or sponsorship team is conservatively building in some type of gap on what they think the cap rates in the market are going to be in five years when they sell from now. No yeah. one can predict that with exact accuracy, but if it's a five year deal, you should at least be adding a point, maybe a point and a half to your exit cap rate just to yeah. stay conservative. Yeah. And, 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 and just a little color around that, Luke, what you're saying basically is like, if, if the cap rate is low, that means you're expecting buyers to be really aggressive and buyers to pay a really high price, right? So it's like, there's more to it than this, but if the cap rate is 7%, then the buyer is expecting a 7% return off that property. But if it's five cap, they only expect a 5% return. So they want it that much more. That's why they'll they'll pay more for it and accept a 5% return. So Obviously, your property is worth a lot more if someone only wants a five percent return off of it. So, what yeah. you're saying there, Luke, is is you want your your um, sponsor to have less aggressive assumptions on their sale price. So, hey, I mean, and, and it's it's incredible, man. It, you can make a deal look so good 
if you say we're going to sell at a five cap. I mean, yep. you know, some of our properties, if we're going to sell at a five cap, it might look like we're going to sell for 10 million. But if I say we're going to sell at a six cap, just a, just one base point difference. If I say, or hundred base points difference. If I said we're going to sell at a six cap, we might be selling for 9 million. So it's a yeah. million dollars difference, right? So you can imagine what that does to returns. So it's a really good point that one little thing can, can make the returns look really good. And, and you're right, Luke, nobody knows, but you'd rather, if you're buying or you, you know, the market you're buying in here in Cincinnati, you know, things typically now it got crazy, but things typically don't trade it in the fives in the five yeah. cap or below. What are, what are you guys at over there in Cincinnati roughly? Yeah. I'll uh, say we were in the fives for sure. Mm -hmm. And I'll say now it's in the sixes, um, even, even some smaller stuff in the sevens, but yeah. So it's so a great point. Luke. So today, if, if somebody's buying at a six cap and that's a good deal, if they say they're going to sell at a five, ah, could we get back to where things are selling at a five cap? Maybe we've, yeah. we were there last year, but man, that's pretty aggressive. What you'd rather see Luke is you'd rather say we're buying at a six. Hey, it might actually move to where we're selling at a six and a half or seven. And that way, if we do sell at a six or we, heck, we do sell at a five, we're going to blow away our expectations. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. It's, it, it just all comes down to how conservative is this sponsor. And yeah. if they're not staying at least a little bit conservative in that area, then you should probably start to question in other areas. Because like yes. you said, you can make a deal look however you want it to on paper. Yep. Yep. No, absolutely. Good stuff, man. Yeah, these are really good. Um, I just think, you know, people... Uh, that, that were in the position you were, Luke, um, just just a few deals ago when you hadn't invested passively. I mean, it's a lot to send to send a sponsor fifty thousand um, dollars. Yeah. You know, whether do, do you even trust that person? Like you said, what's their integrity? That comes number one. Is, can I trust this person? I'm going to send fifty thousand dollars to. But then, hey, they're trustworthy. But are they any good? Are, are they? Yeah. Are they buying? You know, are they any good at this? Uh, what's their track record? Uh, but then, are they buying a good deal in the right market? Those are all things that you really um, need to dig into. So I really appreciate you kind of building that out for us, Luke, because um, it's those, you go through those things. And especially if you do it with somebody else and you're kind of underwriting together, it can really give you the confidence that you need uh, and the assurity that you need to, to, to let go of $50,000 and give it to that sponsor for that deal um, and get it 100%. a great opportunity. So you don't want to, you know, just let fear hold you back forever, but you also want to be diligent. So mm -hmm. yeah, really good stuff, Luke. Thanks for uh, unpacking that for us. Hey, three full listeners, just want to take a quick break from the show to introduce you to our sponsor, Pure Property Solutions. They specialize in CapEx projects for multifamily and commercial properties in the tri-state area. They handle painting, carpentry, roofing, windows, and more. The Pure Property Solutions team prides itself on quality work for a fair price with excellent customer service. They are adept at keeping a good relationship with residents at the job site and are always willing to work toward a creative solution while keeping finances in mind. I can speak to this firsthand. We've worked with Pure Property Solutions on uh, a big project we had that they put in all new windows for us, um, all, all new decks, uh, did some roof work for us, and we just had a great experience. Um, they deliver a uh, quality product. Um, they have good good craftsmanship, uh, good communication. And, and to be honest with you, like not everything went perfectly, um, but when things didn't go perfectly, they, they returned our call, they fixed it, they got out. They heard us and, and, and they made it right. And that's, that's, that's what you want. Uh, check them out. If you've got a big CapEx project in the Tri-State area, check out Pure Property Solution. Uh, the, the link will be in the show notes. Now, back to the show. As we wrap it up here, Luke, I always like to ask, um, what do you think is the key ingredient uh, to being a successful real estate investor? Um, so I'm, that's a, a great question. And I think I'm going to take a little bit different route than most people would say here. Mine, yeah. as I mentioned before, because this aligns with me and I'm sharing this for people who might align with that same perspective. Um, so maybe this input isn't great for everyone, but what allowed me to get into the real estate game in the first place was due to me having um, good financial habits that allowed me to save money. And so having strong financial habits, I think would be my first piece of advice. If you're taking that same route, you want to be a passive investor. Well, if you're going to be a passive investor, money is the only thing that matters. <laughs> yep, um, yep. And, and so having strong financial habits built out and one, one great thing you can do or sit down either with yourself or a spouse and just get clear on what are the things in our life we're spending money on that make us the happiest? Like what's really pushing the needle forward for us? What are those areas that we should either continue to spend on or even increase our spend on? And then on the flip side, what are the things we're not spending money on that don't really move the needle for us? What what doesn't matter as much, but we can see on our, you know, uh, an income statement, a bank statement, whatever it is that um, we're spending too much money here. 
and then cut back there or eliminate it altogether. Yes. And that that tip alone will help you save more money. Um, so that's not, that's, really that's the first thing I would s- share. And then the second is just network like crazy, sure. um, yep. bigger pockets, local meetups, get involved yep. in, in real estate investing groups, listen to podcasts. Like there's a reason that the cliche is your, your network is your net worth and people should yep. really always remember that. So yeah, <clears throat> those are the two, my two pieces of advice, those strong financial great habits ones, and network. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I can't add anything to that. That's really good. Get some good habits, save some money. Um, that's what you need to invest. And then, and then talk to people about how to invest. Mm-hmm. In. It's, it's really good. You're, you're a young guy, so I don't know where you're at with, with your family, but I'm, I'm sure it's something you've thought about almost everybody when they start to think about investing, it's, you know, they're kind of thinking about their future and how they're going to set themselves up or their family and, and maybe pass that along. So, um, what would you say is a key ingredient to making sure that while you are, uh, pursuing success in real estate, you're also having success, uh, with, with, with your family or with, with your faith that that's important to you. You know, the things that are outside real estate that are, you know, much more important in real estate. Yeah, this is this is a really important one to me because I, I've really tried to sit with, you know, people always ask the cliche, what's your big why? And yeah. mine, mine is mine is time freedom. And mm. to take that a step further, it's because I want to have complete autonomy over every hour of my day and what I do with that hour. Yeah. And that leads perfectly into to something like family. Mm. Um, that's the number one priority. Uh, you know, for my wife and I to be able to spend time together and we have a baby on the way in April, our first, so we're super excited about that. Um, And that time freedom allows me to do whatever I please with my time. Um, And there's a really good quote I heard from a guy named Josh Painter. He wrote a book, which I'm yet, I need to read still called um, your best version ever. Mm, And Josh's quote, Josh's quote during uh, one of his interviews is, making your family or spouse the first thing in your calendar as opposed to the last. And that really resonated with me. And so time freedom is huge. Um, my, my more tactical advice for that is, um, if, if you're not at a point where you have that time freedom, but you're trying to create it for yourself, um, other than just real estate investing is get really particular on time blocking your calendar so that when you are, you know, Again, if you prioritize family, it's like, does your calendar show it or not? Yep. Oh, <laughs> so man, that's, that, that's a that's really convicting. big one. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. I need to do better about that. that that's so good, man. Yeah. You, you got to be intentional about it. Um, mm. Yeah. And, so that, and, and you're going to, you're going to find out when they, when the baby comes. Uh, yeah. yeah it, you, you <laughs> and for a, a world change for sure. Yes. Uh, but it's going to be amazing, man. So, so excited for you and your wife. That's going to yeah, be awesome. You. Well, good stuff, man. Yeah. That, that's really good. Uh, learned a lot from you, man. Uh, it, it's great to talk to someone, you know, that is a little bit newer. Uh, into the passive investing because that's where a lot of my audience is. So it's really helpful seeing, you know, the steps that you took to get comfortable with it. Um, so thanks for doing it. Hey, before I let you go, um, I always like to ask my guests uh, for a prayer request that my listeners I might be praying for. Um, you got the new baby in April, uh, that or I- anything else we can be praying for for you? I think that's the biggest thing. Yeah, I appreciate you one. asking about that yeah. though. Yeah, that is a big one. Um, yeah. yeah, that's that's about all that comes to mind for me right now. I yeah. appreciate you asking that though. Yeah, man. Yeah. Good. Everything going well so far. Wife, baby, healthy. Oh, yes. Baby. Yep. Yeah. Yep. For he's like, he's like literally two. She's at, uh, she's at, uh, 28 weeks right now, 27 yeah, weeks. And he's, he's two weeks ahead on his growth. So oh wow, we don't know yet if that's going to lead to an earlier, uh, arrival yeah. than we're expecting. It's too early to tell, but everything sure. outside of that's been going really well. Oh, good, man. Yeah. 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 That's it's a crazy a process, but amazing. Oh, it is. It's going to be wild. It's going to rock your world. Yeah. Um, in, in a really good way. So good stuff, man. Well, again, Luke, thanks so much for making the time. Uh, we really learned a lot, man. It was a lot of fun talking to you. Lee, thanks so much for having me. Really yep, appreciate care, it. See ya. Thank you for joining us for another great episode. I hope you'll take action on what you've learned today. If you enjoyed today's show, please consider leaving Lee a five-star rating and review. And check him out on threefoldrei.com. Until next time, 1 Timothy 6.17.